Hi, this is my review of Fading Glory, published by GMT Games. Uh, it is a, a multi-pack of four battles in the Napoleonic Series 20. So Salamanca, for example, Waterloo. If we have a look at the back of the box. Um, complexity is sort of the lower end of medium complexity, which I would uh, I would agree with. Solitaire suitability is um, right in the middle of uh, medium, which I'd also probably agree with as well. And there is a, um, interestingly, C3i magazine had uh, a, a game in this series in uh, C3i, uh, uh, sorry, C3i magazine number 23, which I'm pretty sure I've got, so I'll have to dig that out. But I've been playing this game quite a lot recently. Um, it doesn't actually take very long to play a game, and I've sort of had it on a, another table, not my main gaming table, um, dipping in and out of uh, the various different games. So what we'll do, we'll have a look at the components, then we'll have a look at a game set up, talk a bit about the mechanics, and then finish with some concluding thoughts. So first up, we'll have a look at the rule book. Um, you get the uh, rule book here, and you also get a playbook, and the playbook has the scenarios and the exclusive rules to each battle, we'll have a look at that. Can look at that in a second. But the actual core rulebook itself—it's not a huge number of pages, twelve pages in total, um, and some of those are optional rules. So nice and colour. Um, it is a—it's not card-driven, but it uh, is sort of has cards in the game, which are quite nice. A sequence of play, very straightforward, um, as you would expect. Um, movement again very straightforward zones of control uh, you know again, straightforward the action reaction phase um, is something that the opposing player can do if cer certain circumstances are met um, mostly do uh, mostly the it's reaction um, for the opposing players covering so horse um, there's some nice examples of play as well um, and then the actual combat again very straightforward we'll talk about the mechanics when we've got the game on the board but as you can see it's a nice spacious layout um, it's very I would say the rulebook is very well written it is a rulebook for a game that's actually quite straightforward um, I did find myself referring to the rules quite a lot during um, gameplay and I think that's Mostly because the actual core mechanics are straightforward, but there's quite a few sort of extra layers on top of that, I would say. So, for example, um, army morale is one of those. Um, so each each army has a number of morale points, and um, you have to sort of manage that through through the game. Um, and then we're into our optional rules. Now, I have played with all the optional rules. That's probably one of the reasons I would say that I had to refer to the rule book a few, quite a few times during play. Um, I think without the optional rules, it's a much more streamlined system, but the optional rules gave it a nice piece of more sort of authentic um, Napoleonic feel for me. Um, so I've used those. Um, maybe if I was playing in solitaire when I played that, I wouldn't perhaps use the, the hidden units, but certainly some of the others I have done, and there's a few pages of those as well, specifically the leaders. So, and again, very nicely written. It's a well, it's a well written, and well edited, um, edited um, rule book. Um, yeah, very nicely done. So not a huge number of pages. Um, so it definitely fits into that sort of the lower end of medium complexity. Uh, you know, when we're talking semantics, whether it's lower end of medium or slightly more on the on the sort of base on the you know um introductory level i'm not sure but for me it fits into that sort of category and then we've got let's have a look at the playbook so this is this um this is an additional book you get and this has the rules, exclusive rules to each of the battles so for example it starts with waterloo um let's have a look at this again nicely done nicely nicely Laid out, well, uh, very spacious. Um, so then we're into, for example, with Waterloo, setting the game up. 
um, sequence of play, who's going first, so the French. We've got random events. So there are specific extra rules on top of the sort of core rule set. This is not a new concept. There's lots of war games I've got where you have sort of a series rule book and then an additional rule book that pertains to all the exclusive rules to the actual battle or whatever in the game that you have that you have purchased. Um, what's interesting is you've got uh, different um, sort of scenarios. So we've got a third day scenario, scenario here, designer notes. It's worth pointing out that the credits for each of the four, I'll call them battles for the sake of argument, um, are, can, can vary. So we're into the designer notes there again, nicely written. Uh, Borodino, uh, which is one of my favourite um, uh, battles of this of, in this game. Actually, I enjoyed Borodino immensely. Um, again, it's the same sort of uh, format: optional rules, variants, designer notes, uh, and so forth and so forth. And on it goes. And so you've got um, quite a lot of sort of scenarios and and four battles in the game, including variants. Uh, Salamanca, uh, enjoyed this one immensely, um, and uh, um, yeah, that was great. So uh, again, sort of same sort of format, nicely done. Not a huge number of pages, not a huge number of additional rules per battle, which is which is which is also why I sort of fit it into that sort of lower end of medium complexity war game. Uh, again, very nicely done. So this is an example of one of the battles uh, laid out. This is Waterloo, and a couple of things straight out the bat. One is this a nice hard-mounted map. Um, it's double-sided. I've played with, and this I bought my copy used, um, and it's definitely been. Uh, I've used played quite a few games now, so it's it's quite hard wearing. I would describe as you can see, it's a sort of smaller physical size compared to a lot of war games that you may be used to that's got an uh, advantage that doesn't take a lot of physical space to play the game you don't need much more space than what we've got set up here actually um, the contents of the hex are very clear it's very clear um, all the gameplay relating to the hex the actual counters themselves are nicely rounded they're quite chunky um, they punch out really easily from the card. Um, they're very nicely done. The contents of the counters are very clear. This is not a, as I've said a few times, not a terribly complicated game. Um, so the, the information of the counters is quite straightforward. Um, and it, it's very, they're very, very easy to read. We've got um, sort of the British, the Prussians and the French set up here for a game based on the on the on Waterloo and predominantly uh, each of the maps follows this sort of same sort of layout or the same sort of information you've got your actual um, the map itself we've got a turn track here with the time of day uh, we've got a morale track weather track for example and where reinforcements will enter the different areas like that we also have a handy sort of guide to the contents of the hex actually printed on the on the actual board so from a sort of physical components point of view very nicely done as you'd expect from a gmt quality then we've got some cards for example here let's have a quick look um each of the four battles have their own deck so this is the waterloo deck it's not a huge number of cards as you can see um these are minus sleeved um, and the card will have both the gameplay for the um, allies, we'll call them, and the French. So, for example, here, it's the, if the French player is using that card, the French section is at the top, allied section at the bottom. Um, and as I've said, it's not a card-driven game by any stretch of the imagination. These just add sort of a thematic uh, and gameplay element to the game. And we enjoy playing with the cards, yeah, definitely. But again, it's not card driven. Um, I think that's probably it in terms of the components. What I would say again is you are getting four um, 
I'll keep calling them battles in the game. So you're getting two double sided maps that, like you can see here and both are extremely nicely done. In terms of the components of the artwork and the layout of the game, it is definitely of a high quality, even though this game is a little old, when I mean, it's 2012, it's definitely still, in, in my opinion, a very high quality production. All the components, like I said, punch out nicely, don't need to clip the counters. Um, and actually, I would say you can get the game um, up and running, certainly with the, the, you know, without all the expanded rules, quite quickly. It's quite quick to punch the counters out and get the game on the table. Now, the reason it's called the Napoleonic Series 20, and this sort of demonstrates it, is not a huge number of counters. So for Waterloo, if you've got set up here, roughly speaking, there aren't many more or up to 20 counters in play for both sides. So we've got, um, and we're I've set a Wellington up if you were using the sort of commander rules. There's only actually three British counters here. We've got a couple here down at the bottom that will be coming into the game later. And a few Prussian counters and the rest are French. So it's not a huge volume of counters game. And it's one of the things that's the most um, uh, appealing or the most um, defining about the game series, in my opinion. Um, what it means is that even with this game here, which is 16 turns, some of these are night turns and there's different rules for, for what happens at night, as you'd expect. It doesn't take very long to play. Certainly no more than, certainly no more than a couple hours to play, I have found. Um, and, and when you get your head around the rules, it's, it's a very brisk um, game and it doesn't matter what of those four battles you're playing, I think the same applies. So in terms of components, I think it's a very, very neatly done, very tidy, well executed. Um, I had nothing, I had no quibbles at all with any of the components of the game. So in terms of mechanics, I'm not going to go through in detail every single mechanic of the game. Uh, that would take me too long and I'm sure there are lots of other videos that can have done that way better than I ever could. What instead I want to talk about are the core mechanics of the game. So, for example, let's have a, and this is just to give you some example of how straightforward the game is. So in terms of movement, we've got a, a British uh, counter here. It has two movement points. Uh, let's compare that to French counter, which has three, for example, for the cavalry, for the horse. So two movement points. Here on our terrain effects chart, the movement costs of all the different type of hexes that there are in the game. Things to point out, open, as you'd expect, is one movement cost. So two, one, two. It's as straightforward as that. Things to, to point out, there are some uh, hex um, contents that will make need you, you, you to stop. So for example, forest is stop, as is rough terrain. Uh, road gives you an extra movement point if you're moving along the road. So it would be three, for example. Um, uh, where else have we got? Uh, zone of control, stop. Very straightforward, neatly done um, terrain effects chart. It also tells you details to you uh, any impact on combat. Combat is as straightforward. On this side of the play array, we've got our turn sequence uh, and a few other tables. And this is not a game with a lot of tables, I will be honest with you. Uh, we talked about the morale. We have a morale track at the top here. It details how the morale is affected. So, for example, when you have a broken unit, which is basically removed from play, though they can, can, can come on later, your morale goes, your morale, if you've suffered the result, your morale goes down, your opponents go up. It's the mechanics seen in other games as well. Let's talk about combat for a moment. And let's pick this, uh, let's pick two. We have the French. It's uh, combat value is two. The uh, British is two. So the combat results table is zero because there's no difference, for example. And we roll a dice and we confer, we, we check what the result is. Tells us on the table what the results are. 
Um, for example, on a zero, if I get a four or a five, the defender is withdrawing. For example, if I get a one or a two, the uh, it's uh, the attacker is routed or withdrawing. Um, so you want to be getting combat strength differential, in, if you're the one doing the attacking, into the pluses sort of zone to increase your odds. Very straightforward. The only point on the combat, again, just check your terrain effects to see what there is, you see what impact the terrain has on the combat. If, for example, let's pick this British one against this horse. In fact, let's actually not do that. Let's pick this example. We have two counters attacking. Well, they're, com they're combat six, for example, combined. So combat, movement, very straightforward. Uh, rallying, um, retreats, again, very, very straightforward. You're only really using this one player raid. So in, in some terms, in some, in some way, uh, at its most straightforward, at its most simple, I think you could um, give this to someone, play this with someone who's never played a hex and counter-based war game before, and I think they would, they would get to grips with the mechanics fairly straight, fairly, fairly well. I don't think a huge amount of knowledge of the history is essential. I think it adds flavour and value to the game, but I don't think it's essential. So in many ways, I would consider this uh, certainly a potential for a, a um, introductory level war game, just with those base mechanics. And then what you can do is you can, even with the cards, they're very straightforward. You can then add on some of those extra rules for, for the com you know, with the commanders and how cavalry work and things like that. So it has, it's quite a sort of an extensive game system from fairly straight, fairly, you know, uh, new and uh, newcomer friendly through to that to sort of more involving and more uh, thematic level. Um, but I found, I played this with uh, people who've never played a hex counter. Well, that's not true. Played some hex counter games um, and they got to grips with the game uh, really straightforward. And it, because it's not a huge number of counters, the information's very clear on the counters the, between the movement and the combat. And combat, um, it's very quick to work out the to work out what the differential is. You just look, you're just comparing the counters against each other, and then just checking, uh, you know, the terrain, for example. Um, and it's not a huge variety in the. Well, they, that's not strictly true. I was going to say it's not a huge variety in the terrain. Probably for for people who play war games, it's, it's not there's not a lot, um, uh, and every, everything is detailed very neatly on the terrain effects chart. So some concluding thoughts. What do I like about this game? Um, I what I like about it is what its strengths are, which is very nice components, rule book very very well written. Uh, all the card components are great. The counters look great. They punch out beautifully. The map looks looks great. Double sided, hard mounted. Uh, you don't need plexi. I like playing under plexi, but I still uh, still quite like the hard mounted maps. The cards are really well done. So all the components are really good. You get four. Um, I'll call them battles. In the game so in terms of the value for money the game is great um, you get a lot of content for your money and um, I think that's a massive plus um, and there for me each of the battles I had my own personal pre favorites mostly because of the history they all played in terms of the mechanics is uh, they all have that baseline level of mechanics, movement and combat, etc. And then they have that e additional extra layer of mechanics um, on top specific to those games. And I enjoyed all of those. So value for money, I think the game is brilliant. Um, and then I think the final strength, or, or one of big strengths, is, is, and it's in the name, Series 20. There's not a lot of counters. It doesn't take long to play. Um, I have many war games that take hours and hours and hours to play and I absolutely love them and I also enjoy playing games that I can set up and play 
either solo or play with someone else in an evening, in a couple of hours, comfortably. And that it might involve just skimming through the rules again, just re-familiarising how the mechanics work. And this is a game series that does that really well. So in that respect, I think it has its, it definitely has its place in my Napoleonic collection, and I've enjoyed playing all the games, all the battles immensely. So for me, that's what it's good at. You can set it up, not a huge number of counters, isn't going to take long to set up, isn't going to take long to play. The core mechanics are very streamlined um, and it has that extra layer of supplementary rules that I, I haven't gone into, but they are adding extra chrome and depth to the game if you want them. Actually, I've played probably now in all the games we've played of this of this, of this this box set, um, played probably half of them, half the games without those, and enjoy, and still enjoyed them, you know. So, does it solitaire well? Yes. There's no AI, there's no bot, you're playing both sides. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I think this is more of a two-player game, because I think that um, a lot of the mechanics, lend, and because you don't have many counters... It's kind of very positional in terms of where you're moving your counters to what your opponent is doing, and you will lose some of that when playing it solo. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy playing it solo to learn the game, and I love the, the Napoleonic period, so I enjoy playing it solo, but I think it's stronger as a two-player game. I will be honest. That's my sort of thoughts to it. So overall, a great package. You're getting four games for the price of one, let's be honest, in the pack in the box. They play really quick, brisk to set up, don't take long, not many counters. If that's your cup of tea for a Napoleonic game that you can play in the evening, I think this is great. The only thing I probably wish there was more of them because you're sort of learning a system, you're playing these, the, the old VPG games, um, you're gonna be challenging maybe to get hold of now. Uh, but you get four in the game, which is great. I just wish that someone would pick the rest up. Um, I'm not sure which ones are the ones I've got now I think about it. I might even have some of these as the original. I can't, can't, I'd have to go through the cupboards. But yeah, um, overall, I think it's, a, you know, I really, I really enjoyed it. And I think it's got, its, it's, got its, its, its place. In terms of introductory level wargaming, I think it's a, it's, it's a good one. I, there were probably other games I would go to, I will be honest. For no reason, maybe it's the number of turns, 16 turns, for example, Waterloo, 16 turns is quite a lot when you're introducing someone to a game. And maybe, and this is true of a lot of games actually, if you've if you've played the game a lot and you're playing with someone who hasn't, um, they, if you're playing very competitively, they're going to have a tough time of it, there are two ways about it. But all that things, so, so yeah, um, value for money is awesome. So yeah, great stuff. Thank you for watching as ever. And uh, yeah, take care. Thank you.